Okay, so where did that leave us? We have there are other, there are a number of other systems uh, where quantum mechanics has been tested in the um, There's some very beautiful um, experiments which are the, uh, the direct extension of the Young Slits experiments, um, in which uh, we have uh, something very familiar with in the laboratory. Uh, but done now, not with single electrons, uh, not even with, um, with uh, single atoms or even single molecules. Uh, incidentally, just a matter of interest, the first diffraction experiments with molecules were done way, way back in 1929. But they were just H2 molecules, two hydrogen molecules. These ones, much more spectacular, they're done with heavy uh, complex molecules, full of these carbon 6 to carbon 7. They have nowadays uh, some uh, uh, small biological molecules. Uh, that's one set of experiments. Uh, there are a set of um, uh, experiments on magnetic biomolecules, um, experiments, very good experiments on homological systems. Um, what are ask what are the number of particles involved in the superposition? That is, how many particles, truly speaking, are behaving uh, increasingly differently in the two space? And the answer is about 1,000 for the uh, free space molecular diffraction experiments, about 5,000 for the molecular biomolecules, something like 10 to 6 for the homological systems. And, well, for the squid, it's um, sort of controversial. But um, uh, by some, some criteria, it's, it's a few or ten to ten. So, in any case, the squids really, I think, hold the Guinness Book of Records in this field of wild consequence of those sort of um, You might ask, incidentally, how do these um, uh, how do these numbers compare to what you would really be prepared to call uh, to state which is distinctively everyday? Life? So I have to ask you the following question: Would you agree with the following proposition? I take the uh, the smallest dust particle that I can see with unaided vision uh, under good illumination, but no no microscope or anything like The smallest dust particle, and I. My two states, then, are the uh, state in which it's sitting at rest and the state in which it's moving through its own diameter over one second. So. Now, would you call those two states macroscopically distinct? If you say yes, then what I have to tell you is that this number is actually less but for that situation than it is for the squid. So, by that definition, at least, the squids really are showing quantum interference, or at least they're consistent with quantum interference, of two states which are different at the everyday level. So, where do we go from here? Um, the most obvious direction in which to go is towards larger and more you know, complex objects. For example, if you think of the molecular diffraction experiments, these have been done by Marcus Arndt and Anton Salinger at the uh, University of Vienna. And if you talk to Anton Salinger, he will tell you, well, um, we've now done carbon-60, we've done carbon-70, we've done small um, biological molecules. No reason in principle we should go on and do, say, biology and eventually a small virus and uh, no one can force it. Uh, and so if it's long enough, uh, he may actually you know, someday be able to put his most obnoxious graduate students to practice the virus. However, I don't think that this is particularly interesting because in all these cases, the, the thing which is behaving differently in the two states is simply the center of mass. And I don't think there's a particular problem with the center of mass of a graduate student or other branches might behave any differently from the center of mass of a fluid molecule. So that perhaps is not the most promising direction to go. If I could do experiments with molecules of biological significance, I'd much rather try to set up a sort of quantum superposition of two states whose biological functionality is different. Uh, an example which has occurred to a lot of people is the following. The initial state of the human visual process is that a, a photon or a bunch of photons gets through the sheath um, uh, of your eye, as it were, hits the retina, and causes a conformational transition, that is a structural transition, in a rhodopsin molecule in, in the retina. Now, um, nowadays, it's quite easy to prepare. Um, every, I mean, no one knows exactly how many, uh, how many photons are so do this, but uh, it's, it's for sure that it's, say, half a dozen people. Uh, a bunch of half a dozen photons. Nowadays, it's quite easy to prepare a form of superposition of the actual state, that is, no photons, and a state containing half a dozen photons. So let us imagine that we shine this superposition onto the eye of the human subject. Then, uh, what we uh, 
Corbinator, John Posey of the is that the state of the Rodolfo is a problem superposition of being triggered, not being triggered. Now, unfortunately, um, if you tell this to the biologists and uh, say, why don't you go and do an experiment along these lines to see if you've really got a point of superposition or not, they will rapidly assure you that this is a totally ridiculous idea because uh, biological systems are warm and wet. And warm and wet, when translated from the language of the biologist into that of the physicist, is overwhelmingly prone to decoherence. So, in other words, uh, the environment is going to come and screw up the phase relations to the point where we just get back to the concept results and all things a waste of time. Probably not such a waste of time. We're actually starting, as uh, the experiment at the University of Norway, uh, to do to go at least the first few steps of that work. In the process, I think it's a bit painful because it's really, in some sense, um, as much in psychophysics as, as it is in foundation physics. But um, uh, we lost all of this experiment with human subjects and we'll see how they go. Um, another direction in which one might um, uh, try to go, uh, uh, well, you can also go in the direction of testing specific uh, examples of naturalistic theories like GRWP. The there are some of these that are along those lines being conducted by that, but so far they've not actually produced any published results. I think the most promising direction in which one would like to go is the direction of direct tests of natural laws. Now, let me just um, preface this by saying, look, um, what we found so far is that everything is consistent with the idea that quantum mechanics is still working, at least at the level of these uh, squids or flux qubits, these devices that are talking about. Um, however, um, <coughs> there is a famous <coughs> theorem, I don't know, a theorem of the philosophy of science, which said that um, if you, uh, if theory, uh, you may have theory two, which predicts experimental result E. You find experimental result E. Does that prove that theory T is right? No, it doesn't. Um, uh, uh, that's the, uh, I think logicians would call that inference the fallacy of the, what do you call it? A firm consequence. consequence. Um, so that's not a valid inference. Um, however, um, so, so in fact, on no finite number of experiments would ever show that one case is right. Uh, however, um, it doesn't work the other way around. It is true that a finite number of experiments in principle will show that theory is wrong. Okay? So if theory uh, T for its experimental result E, and you do not find experimental result E, you can legitimately infer that theory T is principle. So let's, let's go a bit that way. Um, let's try to define our macro-realistic theory and figure it out the time. Uh, and let's take the specific result of the screen. We know that whenever we observe the system, this is an experimental fact, which is well confirmed, whenever we observe the system, it's always either in the state of plus, which is the counterclockwise state, or the state of minus, which is the clockwise state. Okay? So that's an experimental uh, fact. So let's make that, uh, now let's make the assumption that whether or not we observe it, it's always in one or two of those states. There are some slight complications here, but then you know, the transit time are pretty much states, but uh, the still is. Turns out, unfortunately, this postulate by itself is apparently not susceptible to experimental tests. We have to supplement it. We have to supplement it with at least two other postulates. First of all, we can, in principle, determine whether the state is plus or minus, that is, whether the current is clockwise or anticlockwise, without any effect on the state or on the subsequent behavior. That's the, um, the postulate which we call the basic measurability. Finally, uh, one has to make the postulate of induction, which is crudely speaking that the arrow of time flows in the way we normally expect. In other words, that uh, the past uh, can affect the present and the future, but not vice versa. And then it turns out, there's a certain point of decay. Some of you, those of you who know about the EBL blood experiments will also recognize this. In other words, it's a strong analogy. There's a certain point of decay whose value can be directly inferred from a proper set of measurements. And the predictions for decay are as follows. First of all, for the, um, uh, any macro-realistic theory will automatically predict that K cannot exceed 2. That's, I think, a theorem which just about everyone agrees with. Um, second the point is that uh, for an ideal situation, <coughs> no decoherence, no internal dissipation, nothing, then, at least in certain circumstances, quantum mechanics predicts that K is 2.8, which obviously is not dissimilar. 